In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My dear sisters and brothers in Christ, they, they say time heals all wounds. You've heard this. The question I have for you is, do you believe it? Time heals all wounds. Think about what we're actually saying. That given enough time, your hurt won't just lessen, it won't just go away, it will actually heal. Do you believe that? You shouldn't. I know, it, it sounds like one of those like wisdom passages tucked away somewhere in the Bible, right? Just be patient and time will take care of everything, right? Well, it's not in the Bible. In fact, the Bible says the exact opposite. It says things like, don't even let the sun go down while you are still angry. It attributes not time, but the Lord as the one who heals and binds up the wounds of the brokenhearted. Well, if time heals all wounds, if that phrase didn't come from the Bible, then where does it come from? Well, it comes from the only other place that it can. It comes from the world. The world sold it to us as something to replace the healing power found only in Jesus, and we bought it. We bought it. And it's a foolish statement. It really is. And I can prove to you it's foolish. Because the world also has a, another cliche that says, you know what, life is short. Okay, well, which is it? Right? A saying like, time heals all wounds implies you've got time. Just be patient. It will go away eventually. Whereas the other says, time is something you do not have. Life is short. So you better get with it. And quick. Understanding the concept of time is a vitally important thing in our lives, is it not? Think about it. Every single aspect of your life revolves around time. Whether it's time to get up or it's time to go to bed, it's time for work or it's time to retire, it's time for dinner or it's time to clean up, it's time for school or it's time to do homework, it's time to head out or it's time to head home, it's time for your checkup or your time is up. Understanding the concept of time is important. And the Bible does agree with that. In fact, the, the, the Bible is filled with passages that talk about time and the importance of understanding time. But there's one chapter in the Bible particularly that is dedicated just to explaining to you the importance of understanding time. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, King Solomon says this. He, he says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. There's a time for everything. And then he goes on to list like 30 different activities that there is time for. He says there is a time to be born and a time to die, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time for peace and a time for war. Understanding the concept of time is vitally important. And maybe the most important aspect of time is knowing how much time you actually have. And this is what Paul was getting at in our second scripture reading from Romans chapter 13. He, he began our text by saying, Do this 
Understanding the present time. This is one of those challenges you have when you kind of just take a chunk of the Bible and you take it out and say, we're going to focus on it today. You kind of need to know the context because you hear a sentence like that, do this, and your natural follow-up question is, okay, well, what are we supposed to do? This sounds like a very important thing, Paul. And it is. And the this is what Paul had just written about in the paragraph before our text in Romans chapter 13. And you can summarize that entire paragraph in one word. Do this. What do you want us to do, Paul? Love. Love. Here's what Paul writes. This is the paragraph right before our text. He says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law, the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Paul says, love, understanding the present time. Love your neighbor. Because you get what's going on right now. The question is, do you? Do you understand the present time? A, a statement like, time heals all wounds, and, and, and I know this is probably a statement that has gotten, through, gotten you through some tough times in your life. But a statement like, time heals all wounds, does not understand. It assumes that you have time to play with, time to kill, time to do with whatever you want. But Paul would have us understand time a little differently. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. I am not a morning person. For those of you who know me like at all, this is not a shock to you. I, I routinely set my alarm at least an hour before I actually have to get up and get going because it takes me that long. It takes me a long time to actually get up out of bed. It, it takes me even longer to actually get going. It takes me even longer still to be in any sort of thing that resembles a good mood. And I don't think it's because I'm lazy. I don't think that's the reason. I'm just really, really good at sleeping. We all have to have hobbies, right? And this is something I thoroughly enjoy doing. That love for the snooze button, though, that isn't just something that describes my morning routine. That's something that sadly, oftentimes describes our spiritual lives too, doesn't it? Sure, I have time for Jesus. There's always time. Whatever, whatever time I have left over, that is. After I, I focus on me and on my family and on my career and on sports and vacation and school and my future and dating, none of us would admit that our spiritual life is not important to us. But do we actually live like it is? It, is it the aspect of our lives that molds and shapes and prioritizes everything else? Or is Sunday morning just an opportunity for us to hit the snooze button? Sure, we wake up for an hour or two on Sunday morning every now and then, but, but it's really just long enough so that we can roll back over the rest of the week into our spiritual slumber. 
It's time for us to understand the present time, brothers and sisters. And that means it's time for us to wake up for good. Or don't you know that our salvation, that is Jesus, is nearer now to returning than he was when you first believed. We confess that fact here every week. We just did it in the Nicene Creed. That the day is coming when Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. We say it, and I'm sure to an extent, we believe it. The day is coming, we say. But surely not today. And if I'm being honest, probably not tomorrow either. And as long as we keep going down this path, it, it probably isn't even going to happen in my lifetime. You see, as time marches further on away from Christ's first coming, we assume that his second coming lo- it moves equally into the distant future. And when we fall into that mindset, when Jesus' return loses its sense of urgency for us, well, then you need to know that the devil has won a major battle over you. A major battle. Because regardless of what you think, the night is nearly over. And the day is almost here. The night that is this sinful world is fading fast, and the day when you won't be able to hit the snooze button anymore is quickly approaching. Jesus put it this way once. He said, So you must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. So how? How do you prepare for an unknown day? Well, Paul told us this morning in Romans 13. He said, Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. You see, the Christian who understands the present time will wake up and be dressed appropriately by putting aside the deeds of darkness. My favorite college professor used to put it to us this way. Uh, Friday afternoon, after we'd have our our last class and get ready for the weekend, he would always say to us, boys, remember, nothing good happens after midnight. And I think maybe as we get older, maybe it's like, now what, 10 o'clock? Maybe that that statement would, would change too, but it's true. Often it's very, very true. There are certain activities we reserve for the darkness of night. And did you notice what all of those activities that Paul listed had in common? They are all the exact opposite of what it means and looks like to love your neighbor. Sexual immorality and debauchery. Oh, we call it love these days, but it ain't. You know that. It actually is when you use other people for your own self-gratification. Or drunkenness, which renders you incapable of truly loving or serving anyone besides yourself. Dissension and jealousy are what you do and feel When you're competing against someone, not people you're striving to serve, that's what you do to people that you want to hurt and crush and defeat, not people you want to defend and love. And if you say, oh, pastor, you know what, these are just things 
that we all do when we're young or single or lonely or unhappy and whatever other excuse you can come up with. Or maybe you're thinking, Pastor, this is just the way the world works. And if you think people can actually avoid these things, then you just don't understand the times. St. Paul would beg to differ. That if these are the activities that model and shape and define your life, Paul would say, you don't understand the present time. Friends, have you been stumbling here and there through life? Inebriated with alcohol or lust or greed or pride? Has quarreling and strife invaded your home and taken your marriage and your family captive? Has the sexual immorality and sensuality that rules our world, has it captivated your conscience? Are your attitudes and aspirations in tune and with and in light of the Word of God or the confusion of the world's night? Friends, put those deeds away. Take them off. Don't walk around in the clothes that the world wears. Paul goes so far as to say, don't even think about how you might gratify them. And here's the beauty. You don't need to. Because you have been given entirely different clothes. Paul says, rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are not clothes that you need to earn or buy or find for yourself. Jesus has already given them to you. Paul wrote to the Galatians, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You're dressed differently than the world around you. So live like it. You're wearing Jesus. His perfect love, His perfect life, His perfect death, His perfect resurrection poured over you as you were drowned in baptismal water and brought up to live a whole new life. His life. The life of Jesus wearing the white robes of Christ's righteousness and dressed in the armor of light, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of gospel peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. And these clothes, different from the world, communicate that you actually do understand the present time that Jesus is coming back soon to be your judge and you have absolutely nothing to fear because Jesus cannot condemn himself. And it is in him that you are perfectly dressed. You see, when you live a life like that, with that kind of comfort and that kind of confidence, you can do this. You can love your neighbor as yourself because in Christ, you have all that you need and are completely prepared for the last day. Which means that you can actually venture all things for the sake of your neighbor. That you can forgive and love and serve as Jesus loves and forgives and serves you. It means that you can actually bankrupt your whole life out of love for and in service for another. 
Because no matter what you do for someone, no matter how much you give away, you are still promised the riches of heaven itself. And so you will never be bankrupt. Time is an important factor in life. It's even more important for you as a Christian. It's time to wake up from our spiritual slumber, brothers and sisters. It's time to be ready, time to be awake, time to be aware, time to be alive. Because our salvation, and that means Jesus, is nearer now than when we first believed. Every second of every day brings Christ that much closer. He's coming. And so we stand prepared and ready to meet Him. We look to the skies knowing that any moment will be the perfect moment. We look for Christ the crucified, still bearing those glorious scars which sealed our salvation. We look for Christ the resurrected coming to say, peace be with you. We look for Christ the ascended one who will return just as he left. But when he returns, it will be to take us to heaven. We understand the present time. It's a time to put off the deeds of darkness and a time to live in Christ. To live through Christ. That we might live for one another, eagerly awaiting the day when we will live forever with Christ. God grant it. Amen.